Without further ado, welcome to the Nerd HQ stage. Back to the Nerd HQ stage, Joss Whedon. That's what I do best, pass out. Um, hi, I prepared a, a speech. That was it. Um, hope you all enjoyed that. I'm, I'm going straight into questions because uh, all I have to say is, gosh, it's fun to be here. You guys are great. And I think you might get tired of me saying that, but you are. Uh, do, do you want to pick them or do you want me to pick them? Or, well, I think um, you should. Sure. Or I should. What do you want to do? You start, we'll see how you do. Fantastic. <laughs> it's a test. Uh, I'm gonna go right there. Yeah, you. Hi, I'm Janine. I'm from Vancouver. And on my trip to Seattle a couple months ago, I found this fantastic book of Firefly, all three um, volumes celebrating the big book of Big Damn Heroes. So uh, I brought it all the way with me, and I was wondering if I donated $240 to Operation Smell, if you could sign it. 245. <laughs> this is 244. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But don't speak Latin in front of the book, or then they come from the dead. It, it's okay. I don't know any Latin, so. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for that donation. Just hand that book to a volunteer, and we'll get that signed for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. You, yes, sir. You right there with the great shirt. Where'd you buy that? Uh, 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 really cool place. <laughs> um, Joss, wanted, yeah, of course, uh, praise for all your work. But I really want to thank you for the little nugget called uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Really. <laughs> thank you. But, but probably the one question that probably everybody's asking you off to the side and everybody wants to ask you, will there be a director's cut of Ultron? Interesting. I, um, it has always been my ambition never to do a director's cut of anything, always to make the movie with the studio that we both want to make. Ultron was very complex, and, and there was a lot of back and forth. My instinct is no. And I have, just as an artist, I'm super fucking lazy. And that sounds like I'd have to go back, it'd be hard. No, I don't think... There's interest in it right now. I think you'll see a bunch of stuff on the DVD, in extras that were meant to be there, but you know, the narrative came together very close to the way that I hoped that it would, and I don't think it needs me to sort of constantly tweak it. I feel you put something out, and there it is. The first time I ever heard a remix, um, I was 13 and I was listening to the radio. I don't want to tell you what was playing, uh, but we called it the wireless. Amos and Andy were so funny. Open the closet door. Oh, wait, no. Um, and, uh, but literally heard a song that had been remixed, and it freaked me out so much that I turned off the radio, and I've never listened to it since, literally. That is an actual truth, because I feel like, wait, that was the song. You can't, you can't do that, of course. Our entire culture consists of doing exactly that, but um, I'm not for it. If I tell a story, I want that to be the story that I told. Ultron may have... Um, some transitions that I'm not 100% on board with. It's also one of the most ridiculously personal things I've ever put on screen, and the fact that Marvel gave me that opportunity and, and supported it, I'm very happy, um, very proud of everybody who worked on it. I don't feel the need to go in and, and fix. I feel like there she is. Wait, there are two right in front. There's one in front of the two that are right of each other. Believe that was very specific. <laughs> Hi, Das. Um, I was wondering, because of you, I went from a very lonely person because of your work to somebody who has best friends now. And I was wondering if you ever knew when you were writing Buffy and Angel and Firefly, if you knew the kind of impact it would have on people where, um, you know, you've changed our lives. Um, they used to be my friends. And now I'm the lonely one. <laughs> they liked you better, and that's fine. Um, 
Uh, I wanted it to have an impact on people, but I did not understand the kind that it would have. I did not understand the ways, not just that people would get something from the narrative, but the community that would form and that, you know, timing-wise, you know, the internet and the bronze and all of these communities were really just starting to happen. And um, a lot of them happened around Buffy and the sharing of that shared experience worked in a way that it, it, it never has. And um, my favorite things are when I hear people like, oh, we never got along, my parents or my brother or whatever, but we would watch Buffy or something that, you know, it, but uh, the people that it's brought together, how can you, I don't, how can you know that's gonna happen? <laughs> Um, what I wanted to do is give people strength in themselves, um, that they were able to communicate that and celebrate it together is a completely unexpected benefit and one of the best things. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's a, good, a nice thing to hear. But they were my friends first. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Kind of to follow up on that, um, your work has had a big impact on my life. Um, I watched Buffy with my mom when I was a kid, and I didn't realize that you were the writer-director until after I saw Avengers, and I went back and I realized that... Um, I've been repeating myself. <laughs> <laughs> Only um, have one idea. Thanks for bringing that up. That um, You should I'm, probably pick. <laughs> that I am in part the person I am today because of that work. So thank you very much. Um, my question is, uh, as a writer, do you start writing um, for yourself and edit for your intended audience? Or is the audience something that is always um, in the back of your mind the second you start a new project? Um, <clears throat> you are always writing for only yourself and everybody in the world. Those are the only two people that you care about. And um, it's absolutely for me. But um, because if, if you start trying to write towards somebody else, um, you lose yourself, you lose the integrity, you lose the, the ability to find the truth of the moment. You have to, um, it has to come from you. It has to come from what you care about, what makes you cry, what makes you laugh, what makes you, um, get all sexy time, like all of that stuff. Um, the good and the bad, it has to be you at the same time. I could not keep a diary as a child because I was like, but what happens when it's published? Like I, um, everyone would know. I wish that I didn't think that while practicing my Oscar speech uh, when I was nine in front of the mirror. I've almost finished it. Um, uh, minor tweaks. Uh, but no, it's, it's, uh, there's a, the, even then, I was censoring myself in that sense of like, well, I really can't actually write down what I think about my family because, um, and about life because uh, someone will read it and then everyone will be sad. Um, so you, you got it in the back of your head all the time, but uh, you sort of just, if it works for me, I feel like it will work for other people. That's the only thing that I feel confident about when I'm writing. I'm like, if, if I think this works, I, then it will. Um, if I hire really pretty smart people to say it. <laughs> um, or get Nathan, if you don't use. <laughs> um, all right. Mr. Fella Guy. Hi, my name's Eric. Um, I, no, it's I, Mr. Fella Guy. <laughs> I'm an I'll icon. I can I just will... change your name. <laughs> and I am going to the courthouse have... right after to do that. <laughs> um, you made a statement earlier that Avengers was the most personal thing that you've made, and so I've got to follow up on that. And I'm also wondering why you included like Ultron as like an Old Testament god figure, and he had Vision as a Christ figure in that movie as well, which I thought was interesting. Um, there's a lot of Christian iconography going on because everybody in that movie thinks that they're the savior, including Tony. Um, and it's like, dude, look at your beard. You're a supervillain. <laughs> um, uh, we evoke that stuff mostly because um, it's resonant to how, to the idea of whether or not we can solve something 
uh, whether or not we can evolve, whether or not we can be our best selves. Obviously, I don't want to say, look, the vision is Jesus, and he's the mean guy from the First Testament. Like, I don't want to be specific, but everybody is definitely going to bring that into play. It just, first of all, there's a shorthand to it that people understand. When somebody starts talking like that, um, they kind of need to be shut down a little bit. Um, as far as um, the vision is concerned, there is also a sort of, well, he actually is a step above. Um, and what I love about him, first of all, Paul Bettany. Oh my God. Oh my God. And um, <clears throat> tiny sidebar, when I took my first Avengers meeting ever on the first one, I was like, I don't know if we should do this, but if you do a second one, it has to be Ultron, and then he has to make the vision, but then they have to put Jarvis in the vision so that Paul Bettany can play the vision, because only Paul Bettany can play the vision. <laughs> And three years later, I got to call Paul and say, listen, will you do a thing? And he, God, he's so good. But what I love, maybe my favorite thing in the movie, maybe the thing I'm proudest of is his conversation with Ultron at the end, um, uh, where he's just like, you know, humanity is doomed. And Paul's just like, yes. And it gave me the chills slash creeps so much that we finally made like a, somebody who was we know he's worthy, we're gonna play him. So it's like, we know he's a pure being, and yet he very dispassionately is like, oh yeah, no, you, these guys are over. And, um, but with love, that is interesting to me. Um, all of that stuff, all of the sort of religious overtones and all that iconography, it's, it's deliberate, but it's meant to be, um, not vague, but it's meant to be interpreted individually. Okay, um, you know, I'm just the responsibility, but it's just oh, right there. There you are. Boom. Anything you could tell us about more Dr. Horrible? <laughs> people don't want that. <laughs> um, uh, people do want that. Um, the people who would do that want to do that, but um, as, as is always the case, uh, they all have jobs, and all of the jobs that they don't have, Neil has. <laughs> so, um, you know, I feel like a heel for being like, any minute now, for about five years, but um, we feel passionately about it, but uh, that also means that we passionately don't want to get it wrong. The last thing we want to do is for you guys to go, yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, it's, it's gotta be right, so hopefully we'll open a window. Um, ma'am, wavy ma'am. Hi, um, first of all, thank you for everything that you've given us, um, and especially for Buffy. I was such a huge fan of that that I bought a lot of the props when they were auctioned off, including Olaf's hammer. Um, so I'm wondering, yeah, oh, I would love it. It's like amazingly light, you guys, it's foam. Um, <laughs> Shh. Yeah, I, I can wield it with Buffy-like strength. Um, but I'm wondering, what is your favorite and your least favorite season of Buffy and why? Uh, um, I don't think I have a least favorite. I really don't. Um, I think if I went back and watched them, I'd go, well, in the first season we, had 12 episodes and we were finding our way and, and you know, some of the stuff wasn't in place. And uh, it was kind of baby steps a little bit. Uh, but, um, uh, but, and as for favorite, uh, I probably, this would change a lot of times, but I might have to go with season five. Um, just, I feel like that, uh, that mission was accomplished um, really well. But I'm a big fan of season six, so because I like porn. So um, <laughs> it's called erotica. Okay. Um, the uh, when we finished season five, the mandate was next season we're gonna lighten up. <laughs> it's gonna be way less dark. <sighs> well. Yes, but the behind the, yes, the farthest away, man. 
farthest away man, have you met fella guy in Wavy Man? <laughs> you should all get together and have a support group. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have been an admirer of your work for a long time, and, uh, but later in life I realized you worked on a movie I grew up on, and it's one of my favorite movies of all time called Toy Story. And um, uh, now that I know you worked on it, I can hear your, your voice everywhere in the film. Um, <laughs> not physically, but uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the writing bits. I just sit in the theater, I'm like, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> I hate children. Your toys will crawl in your mouth and suffocate you. Have a good game. <laughs> is that bad? Is that, is that a bad message for kids? Sorry, go on. Um, and, I, and I know there was a, a, a nice uh, chunk of that in, in the biography, uh, but I was wondering if you could share a story that you maybe haven't shared about that yet, and I was also curious if uh, the Combat Carl riff was something that you came up with, because that's a, a special favorite of mine. That is not mine. Um, they already had Arlie Army. They all do exactly what they wanted to do with that. Um, a lot of what you probably hear as my voice is those guys, because, um, you know, we worked so closely. I don't know what's in the biography. Um, do I die at the end? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> all right. Don't tell me. But, um, uh, but, you know, we, uh, it was me and John and, and mostly uh, Pete Doctor and Andrew Stanton and the late Joe Ramft, who was amazing, just sitting around throwing ideas back and forth while they all drew incredible little pictures until they got Sharpie headaches and then they had to go outside. And um, uh, so, you know, I got to sort of bleed my voice in, but that process is incredibly holistic. And so we're coming back at each other. So there's a, there's a big mix. There's a lot of stuff I'm like, I don't know who wrote that. Um, but, uh, and I did not, I have to say, with all humility, come up with the claw, which is probably the, the signature moment. That, that, that was them. Um, the animators are always writers on an animated movie. And in fact, Lasseter was the first person to say, let's give these guys credit. Um, usually they just sort of, um, you know, they're listed as animators, but he was like, these guys created this story and I want to give them credit for it, and we did, which is cool. I don't know if that's in the, if that's all in the biography, sorry. <laughs> Not new or interesting. This all the way over, yes, ma'am. Hi, oh my gosh. Hi, Joss Whedon. Hello, I'm gonna try not to cry here. Okay. Um, anyway, I really appreciate you, I'm just gonna say that, um, and not go any deeper. But um, I was wondering, as um, someone who's trying to, are you not gonna look at me when I'm talking? Um, <laughs> as, uh, oh, he's looking deep into your eyes right now. Uh, as someone who's trying to get into the business like, of writing and directing, um, how do you go from, don't, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> now I feel weird if I look at you and I feel weird if I don't look at you. <laughs> do whatever you want. Um, how do you, as a writer, separate yourself between the lines of writing and directing? Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, as much as possible, I try not to. When I am writing something, I am already directing it. I am writing it to be viewed a very particular way. Um, a lot of writers start directing to protect their work um, because they've seen other people do it not the way that's not in their head. And obviously, we all have a bit of that. But for me, it's always one thing. It's storytelling. And one is the extension of the other. So. Um, I feel like I start directing the moment I start writing. So, like, um, I heard that sometimes you just pull out your iPhone and you and you shoot scenes, like when you're when you're directing. Yeah, and so, just like text. No, like, like, no, like, great. no, like you're like filming on your iPhone. So, like, when you do that, you're not, obviously not thinking about that in the writing room. You're not like, oh, I'm gonna pull out my iPhone here and do this. You're just like pulling it out and saying, hey, this is cool. Uh, yes, I have. I haven't made a ton of iPhone movies. Um, no, but in, in, in like Avengers or in like while you're filming like the big stuff. Yes, every now and then we did actually use a couple of iPhone shots um, when we were shooting Avengers. Just because there's so much going on, you just you kind of want to just get more of it if possible. Um, and uh, you know the exciting part is once I'm not always writing when I'm directing, although I spend a lot of time on set going, we could do better. Or here's a different idea. Why don't you try this? Um, but mostly. You know, I'm pure, I get to be purely visual at that point, and, um, uh, and all I want is, you know, more. <laughs> I want to, like, capture as much as I can, because all of these people are going to leave, and then they're not coming back. 
Um, sir, I'm a, beard, I'm a bearded man. Uh, sorry, yes, uh, um, elderly Jesus. Um. What a crazy do, you, do you lead the support group you're all going to be a part of? <laughs> I just have one question. How is Steve Rogers not worthy? Is he not? Are we sure? Did he fail or did he stop? <laughs> he actually worked as a coyote um, and exploited a lot of people and terrible things uh, in between the two movies. And that's actually, it was weird that he chose that for a job, but so. Um, you're surrounded by like all your fans and everyone who loves your work um, and you're at Comic Con. If you could attend a panel and ask a question to someone that you respect, who would it be and what would you ask? Ooh. Um, uh, well, I, I, I think iZombie did a pan a thing and I didn't get to see it. I would want to, I would just be like, why are you awesome? <laughs> and then I would be like, why aren't you looking at me? Okay, so first of all, I just want to say that The Avengers is the movie that made me love movies, and I want to be a director, so thank you for that. Otherwise, so right now, there's so much new technology becoming popular, like drones and holograms and um, what did I write here? virtual reality. What of this technology are you most excited to use in film? For me, drones. Drones are wonderful, because they really give you something that we could not accomplish um, filmically up until, because uh, a crane can do so much, a helicopter can, you know, there's a sweet spot in the middle where you can get footage of an environment or whatever with a drone that just you could not get. And when we shot in Seoul, we had this extraordinary drone pilot, you know, flying through and getting these flying shots through pillars and under path, you know, overpasses and stuff that, we also had, I think it was his brother, uh, running the remote control car that, that was this big that weaved through every like traffic thing we did it was just the both of them are like amazing and that stuff is is um, When it's not you know bombing and spying uh, Is a super exciting technology for me the virtual reality thing is very much like that's creating an environment and I'm much more linear in my approach to narrative. I'm very old-school that way That's why I don't play a lot of video games. I'm sort of like no we you <laughs> I'm gonna choose what door you go through. Damn it. Um, you have to take over choosing. Well, let's do it. Pressure let's do it. is killing me. Um, I'm scared of everyone. All right, why not this guy right here? It was the puppy dog, I think. First, thank you for doing the camera guy a favor. Every time I raise my hand, I cover both your faces. <laughs> Excellent. I'm so sorry. Um, getting to the, the business side, that sometimes as an artist that's the most difficult part for people is to, to put aside um, that and sell it to somebody. Um, you've been wildly successful at selling very original properties, and I'm going like back and forth with this. So. Mm -hmm. uh, um, w what advice can you give to people who are trying to get their own properties made that are original like yours? I don't have a ton of great advice. Um, I had a weird mix of good luck and bad as as everybody does. Um, uh, the only thing I would say is um, it never occurred to me that I wasn't right about Buffy or Firefly. And, um, you, and people and say, did you expect Buffy to become a pop culture icon? I'm like, why do you think I wrote it? And that isn't... <laughs> That isn't like, oh, I want to, oh, I want to be super famous and, uh, and all this good stuff. I was like, you have, you, when you have a title like that, you must have enormous, unreasonable faith in yourself. And that is the biggest thing for me, is that feeling like I know what I'm doing, which I only feel when I'm telling stories. I cannot walk through a door or have a human conversation, but I can write a story. And knowing that this is what I want to do and I'm not really interested in tweaking it to become something that somebody else wants. 
and which always leads me to my number one thing. I saved my first paycheck. I saved my second paycheck. I made sure that I never sat down at the table I couldn't walk away from. Because if, I didn't, if they didn't get the thing I wanted to give them, then we should not be working together. And um, that sort of insane confidence um, is, uh, you know, you're gonna have so many people telling you no or tearing you down, and, and that's sort of the thing that carries me through, a complete, unhinged lack of reality. Good luck. <laughs> That's right, it's on me. Uh, I was over here, I'm gonna go over there now. That lady in the back with the glasses. Yes, you, yes. Hi, Joss. Um, we have a thing that we call Joss people, which is actors that you reuse in your shows and movies. I like the term recycle. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if there was anyone that you have used in the past that you want to use again, but just haven't had the opportunity yet. Um, yeah, there are many, 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 many. Um, I'd have to say, if you were like, you gotta make a movie right now uh, with somebody that you haven't got to work with enough, um, that someone would be Mark Ruffalo. Uh, I think he's as good at acting on film as anybody in our country, and he is so much nicer than I am. He is just a darling dear. Did you see Foxcatcher, by the way? Did anybody here see yeah. Foxcatcher? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, not a lot of people saw it. Unfortunately, did, did you see it? Yes, I did. He was fucking awesome in that So movie. good. It was so weird that he embodied that wrestler. You guys should go see it just for him. He literally plays a real wrestler, but he walks around like with this like, you know, kind of like this weird, like this thing, you know? <laughs> Which is, I guess, how wrestlers walk back in the day. Um, but he was so Which good. Which wrestling matches are you going to? <laughs> you don't want to know. Actually, you do want to know. Um, but, uh, but even the stuff when he was like training and like training the wrestlers, it looked so fluid and real as if he had been doing it his whole life. And I was like, man, that's a committed actor. That's yeah, he, good. no, I, I don't, I think he's incapable of uttering an untruth. Like yeah. just, he's, he always becomes the thing. Yeah, that first scene of the two of them, when they're just like aping. And he actually told me they shot like nine pages of stuff about their relationship. And then they got in the editing room and saw that the two of them wrestling. And I was like, oh no, we know everything. We don't need any of that. Wow. Yeah, because it was so specific how he was the older brother and how that was great stuff. Sorry, we're just going to have our own time. Uh, you guys just I'll tangent talk occasionally. amongst yourselves. Um, <laughs> oh, the power. Uh, I'm going to go you, sir. You, sir, right there. Hi. Uh, I wanted to say first congratulations on the Comic-Con Award. Thank um, you. Um, that, that panel, really good. I have it right here. Um, then I wanted to say, I wanted to know, uh, so, you know, the, we've seen you in front of the camera a couple times. Um, and it looks like you're going to be in uh, Con Man, uh, or at least a cameo. Uh, and I was, it's a very moving line that I have. I was curious, you know, now that you're unemployed, um, <laughs> have you ever considered actually having a role as opposed to a cameo? Um, am I a wannabe actor? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, and sometimes I think, I'm quite good. And then I see somebody like Nathan or someone who's just like a natural performer. I'm like, I'm quite not good. <laughs> also, this fizz was made for radio. So, um, yeah, I would love to. It's fun to dabble, but I don't want to like... And I, I was going to cameo in Dr. Horrible, but... I didn't have time. We didn't have playback. I had to be behind the camera. Um, I'm always sort of almost doing it. And then, um, but I think I, I'm very worried about that moment when people go, oh, look, it's his self-indulgent phase. And, um, you know, I, I do think that everything I want to do, there's somebody who's better qualified and slightly prettier to do. But, you know, who, I won't rule anything out because the, one of the big things is, can I terrify myself? How can I learn a new skill and, um, and possibly fail? Those are the things that I, I look for in life. So <laughs> uh, 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 miss there with the red, the red arm, red arm. It's a Picardigan, but. <laughs> a Picardigan? <laughs> okay. That's good. Thank you. 
Um, Joss, first off, thank you for being a champion for women. Just, you're awesome. Um, <laughs> to follow up on Much Ado, if you could make another Shakespeare adaptation, would you? And what would be your number one choice? Well, there's a few. Um, uh, I'm obsessed with Hamlet. We all are. Who's not obsessed with Hamlet? Um, Twelfth Night, I think, is really underrated. Um, pole position right now, Othello. Yeah! Uh, let's go right back. I think you with a purple, is that purplish hair right there? Yeah, you've had your hand up for a minute. Hi. Along the lines with the question about the cameos, I was wondering if you could give some background on the um, voiceover cameo in Serenity and how that came about. Was it like in post-production or did you know you were going to do that or... What's the story behind oh, I mean, that? Oh, y'all round coach, that one. Yeah, how humiliating is that every time I hear it? That was literally, yeah. I'm in the editing room, and we laid it down to fix it later, and then we ended up keeping it, and I... So I think we all agree I, um, my acting career can wait. Um, uh, in um, uh, Age of Ultron, there's a moment uh, where Iron Man flies in, says we have to talk, shoots everybody, and then says, good talk. And you just hear one of the guys, no, it wasn't. <laughs> that, um, that was our editor, Jeff. Because um, I was like, just start, let's just try this. And so he threw it down. And we're like, we're not changing that out. <laughs> that is, that, you, you can't do better than that. So, and that stuff happens a bunch. Um, you know, you just sort of, every now and then you throw something in and you get these guys who just nail it. So if you have it, keep it. On that one, I don't know what went wrong. We ran out of time. Did you, did you get a Wilhelm scream in Avengers at all? You know, I have, or have you gotten one in anything yet? I try to take them out. <laughs> no, I do, I do. Because I feel like it's, it's insider baseball and it feels lazy to me. Oh. I, I, and I, it's a tradition. Here, there's a few traditions that I sort of bucked. And with the Wilhelm scream, they wanted it in Serenity. Everybody wants the Wilhelm scream. And in fact, they had it. Uh, Summer kicked somebody off the stairs and they put in the Wilhelm. And I'm like, first of all, that to me says, this is a movie, we all know it, and, and it's, it takes me out of it. Second of all, that was a woman that she kicked, and so the, uh, that should be Wilhelmina. Um, totally different scream. Uh, they also uh, tried to sneak R2-D2 onto the helicarrier, because um, they like to put him in everything. And maybe they did, and like found a new place, but they, like, I saw it, and they're like, hey, it's fun, we put R2-D2, and he was, in, first of all, enormous in scale. So it's like, oh good, because we want it to look like a model. That's good, that will make a difference. Um, but I, you know, I feel like that's not about the movie. That's not about the audience's experience. And so I try not to do stuff like that too much. Uh -huh. But if you'd like to do a Wilhelm, if you feel, if, if you've prepared a Wilhelm for us. Oh, for today? Yes. No, 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 these vocal no. cords are not happening right okay. now. Okay, no. I should have caught you on Thursday. <laughs> uh, you right there. Um, hi, Josh. Uh, why are you awesome? Uh, uh, no, what I, what I really wanted to ask was, um, a lot of people think you're one of the greatest feminist writers um, ever. Um, you've done a lot for women, as someone else just said, um, with Buffy, and then with Gay Women with Willow, and then uh, The Larger Woman with uh, Miracle Laurie and Dollhouse. And I was just wondering, what are you going to do next for us women? <laughs> Haven't I done enough? Um, I'm so sick. Um, who's, who's thinking about the white guy? Who's, who's telling the rich, rich white guy story? Where's my Selma? Um, Oh, there is a line. Oh, okay. Uh, there's a so there's a line. Um, you know, the thing is, uh, thank you. I don't, I think that I'm not going with great feminist writer of all, blah, blah, blah. I think um, I was lucky enough to have an impact at a time when an impact was needed um, and therefore got noticed for something that was never really an agenda so much as just like these are the stories that interest me, these are the people that I want to be. And um, so, uh, so that is the sort of thing that like, the reason I left Twitter 
um, was not because of all the hate, um, so much hate, um, but, uh, but because of all the things that I care about, like the, the articles I would read and the, the causes and the things. I'd be like, oh, I need to talk about that. I need to talk about that. I need to talk about that. And I could not have an idea because I had this noise in my head, this noise of agendas. They were my agendas, but that is not how you create at all. Again, it has to be. You have to silence everything else and just go, you know, what's in here? Um, hopefully, the stories will continue to be textured and create, you know, roles for women that are, and men that are interesting and, and worthy, but I can't, I can't go at it as like, oh, well, now I have to bring my politics to the blank page because that does not fill the page with anything except a lecture and people know it. Next question. Uh, this gentleman on the aisle right here. Yep. Hey, Josh, thanks for being here. I have to say, The Avengers is one of my most favorite films of all time, and I was wondering in those films, what was the most fun or enjoyable scene to write and or direct? Um, you know, I, uh, uh, I have two answers, and, and I'm going to have to give it up for uh, Natasha and Loki um, as uh, just a dream to write, and then two actors who are word perfect and, and riveting. Um, that was, and that really weird sell. That was a good time. Uh, somebody, people always ask me, are you excited? Oh my God, you must be so excited. And robot-like, I say, no, I'm, I, do not, I do not have that. Um, I, uh, I, don't, I don't get excited when I'm uh, supposed to. And somebody asked me about Avengers when we started, are you excited? And uh, um, I was like, I'll let you know. It'll happen. Don't know when. Probably about six weeks in, we were shooting Everybody Argues in the Lab. Everybody and their mother. And Tony and um, Steve are going at each other. And I gave them a couple of notes and walked back to the monitor and was just like, it happened. <laughs> and I had that moment of like, I do this for a living. <laughs> um, so that's a big fave. Next question. Uh, in the back, back there. Yeah, right. Hey, Joss. Uh, love all your work. Um, to me, you're probably my favorite character killer of all time. <laughs> Suck it, George. <laughs> <laughs> awesome response. Um, <laughs> Shooting Kitty Pride into space was probably one of my favorite should-be deaths. I'm just wondering, have you masterminded any deaths in your head that haven't made it into production that you'd be willing to share with us? You know, I, I don't actually sit down and go, mmm, kill. <laughs> That's, killing is a hobby. It has, it's not about what my art is about. Um, <laughs> Oh, like I'm the only one. Okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, no, I, um, I believe that people are taken from us very suddenly and it's important in a narrative to um, not only remember that, but also remember that, that that is one of the ways you can subvert a very sort of obvious narrative flow and turn it into something um, more interesting and, and more compelling. Um, but uh, so I believe strongly that it has to happen sometimes in stories, but uh, it is not, I mean, I don't have like, you know, a post-it that says kill. Um, you know, I just, uh, I just wanna make sure that the stories matter to people. And if people think that I kill a lot of people, proportionally watch a procedural because they got the most bodies of anyone. I'm actually terrible about, like Buffy was the least frightening horror show ever made. It's like, because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to hurt people. <laughs> like I, they matter. I don't, it's like seeing bodies lying around. So it's, uh, it, the, I respect the people that I'm writing about and it's hard for me to write people that I don't, so it's hard to write a bunch of dead bodies, but every now and then um, there are certain truths that I will come back to and, and death comes to us all in time. 
unless you're an icon. And then, uh, or Comic Con, um, and then, you, I, right? I live forever now, right? Yeah, I think you live forever. I oh, think sure. that, good. That, that's, that's good. the deal. That's good. Uh, let's go. This gentleman right here with the glasses. Okay. Um, con man filled Hall H and the Indiegogo campaign raised over $3 million in a very short amount of time. Con man being peripherally related to Firefly. At what point do you think some executive at some network is going to think to themselves, hey, maybe Firefly was a good idea after all? Um, uh, you know, I kind of thought it was going to happen a while ago. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, there's a little bit of, of rights between Fox and Universal that I don't know if that, but um, because one had the show and one had the movie and it gets sort of a little, a little funky fresh with that, but for, quite frankly, I don't ask because um, as, you know, more than in any, any other crew, I would love to get that crew back together, but I also um, want to, you know, do the next thing and, um, and try to have a new thought. Um, I don't guarantee anything, but uh, it's, it's, I'm very terrified of monkey's paw. I'm very terrified of like, we bring it back and it's not as good, or I don't, I don't have the same, you know, mojo, or it's just as good, but we've all seen it, so we're sort of like, mm, I don't know. Um, Obviously, I'm as excited as everybody else about Full House. Um, thank, God, thank God that's coming back um, with Coach um, because, you know, that's, you know, nostalgia is my favorite thing in the world. It's absurd to me they're bringing everything back. But um, if we brought Firefly back, it would have to be like so many pieces in the right place at the right time. And so I can never say, oh, yeah, we might, because then it will be on the internet that it is definitely happening, which I've already gotten at the con. Or if somebody came up to me and said, I heard you're doing Firefly on the internet. I was like, you're going to hear it tomorrow, too, because um, this is what always happens. But uh, I think um, I'm very proud of it. I love it very much. I miss them all very much. But um, it would have to be the next story to tell and not just an excuse to party with the people I love. Uh, we got time for one, maybe two more questions. That guy, you, you are lifting your arm. You're literally, you've been holding it. Uh, that guy right there. Yeah. Oh, now there's pressure to this question. Okay. Don't screw it up. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, I'm Chen from Israel. Hi, Joss. Uh, you have a great fan base in Israel. Uh, so definitely come. We like, you know, you're probably a national hero there because we're a small country. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, for, for us, you already are, but uh, okay, so my question, uh, let's uh, breathe, thank you. Uh, so you uh, create, and uh, uh, as a writer, I'm sorry, I just put it, uh, ah, okay, blah, blah, blah. So, what is uh, the first story you created? I mean, not for, I don't know, uh, for TV or anything, but no, even as a child, what is the first story you remember you created to yourself? Like, I don't know. Uh, um. I spent a lot of time uh, by myself, what a shock, and uh, um, mostly just uh, not stories at first so much as universes. I would create like an entire universe of different characters um, and, uh, um, and sort of they would populate it. I would imagine them and sort of build all this stuff but never actually like put it into a narrative form. It just sort of swam in my head. Um, and uh, for hours and hours and hours. And basically, at the center of my weird little universe were, was a guy named Harry Egg and his uh, best friend, a um, sexually ambiguous demigod named Mouse Flesh. <laughs> Can we make that movie? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the time. I'm so sorry. Did you have a good time? Yeah. Guys, keep your hands going for Josh Sweden. Oh, thank you. Thank you guys so much, dude.
Joss Whedon, everybody. Joss Whedon, clap him off the stage. Keep it going, keep it going.